Well, thanks all for coming tonight. And Gio, you're interested in this uh, Sydney icon. The talk is particularly relevant this year because this is also the year of its demolition. Firstly, a few points of explanation on the structure of tonight's talk. I'll be using both projected images um, and the 1 to 48 scale model. The talk's divided basically into three parts. The general history, which will be um, projected images. The fabrication, construction and the testing of the crane, which will be addressing the model. And then finally, details of the crane, photographs both up on the crane and from below. Those are also projected images. Okay, general history. Uh, this is a view um, of Garden Island, the original Garden Island from the domain. You see Fox Point there, the original Garden Island there, with not much on it. There probably would have been a few gardens, but you can see the, the hill on the south hasn't been demolished. That was demolished in the, or started to be um, excavated in the um, 1885s both to construct the level building site and also to use that as fill to create a larger area for the island. Aerial photograph from the north, so you can see what's point to the, to the south, the original Garden Island and a few of the landmarks there, the old prison, uh, stores building, the oil store and the, the workshop complex there and also the shear legs crane, which I'll be talking about tonight. Current view of the island, but we're showing it an overlay of the profile or the, the edge of the original Garden Island in green and the foreshores of Potter Point. The blue indicates the foreshore as it is now, after all the filling and work that's been done. The area for the Graving dock is that. We've got the new fitting out wharf there, which was constructed. Position of the shear legs crane, which is there. The 250 ton hammerhead crane there, and the 40 ton travelling crane there, which was actually used to construct part of the, uh, the hammerhead. What cranes were available before the hammerhead was built? And I'm talking about heavy lifters here. So the shear legs crane was 160 tonne. So in uh, 1892, Easton and Anderson of London were commissioned to fabricate 160 tonne shear legs for the original Garden Island dockyard. The crane was erected in 1893, western side of the island between the fitting shop, this one on the left, and the oil store. At the time, it was reported to be the largest crane in the world. It consisted of two pivoting A-frame legs, 137 feet high. So they're the A-frame legs. And they were pivoting at their base with a rigid rear stay. So that's the rear stay, and it was 187 feet long. Luffing, that's the moving of the jib from over the ship back onto the wharf, was achieved by moving the base of this stay, the rear stay, along horizontal slides with a steam-driven wrought iron lead screw, 60 feet long and 10 inches in diameter. The other heavy lifter that was around was the 150-ton Titan floating crane. It was fabricated by Cowns and Shelton and Company of Carlisle, England in 1916, then assembled at Cockatoo Island Dockyard in Sydney, where it remained for the rest of its life, working around the Sydney foreshores. Completion in 1919 was delayed by the loss at sea of the twin 40-ton lead screws for elevating the crane's jib. So inside the tower, there are two big lead screws which enable the jib to be raised and lowered. It could also swivel on its face. The Titan had a maximum lift of 150 tonnes. It was supported on a pontoon barge. 176 feet long, 79 feet wide, and 13 feet in depth. And it was unpowered, so it needed two tugs to move it around the harbour. The Titan was used extensively in the assembly of the hammerhead, particularly transporting and placing the concrete pier sections. Unfortunately, the crane was lost in December of 1992 off the north coast of New South Wales while being towed to Singapore for salvage duty. There are a number of smaller dockside tower cranes. 
of approximately 10 tonne capacity. The Mortstock crane, which is this one, uh, dates from 1924. It was relocated to Goat Island where it is now, so that's Goat Island. Some of the early stone buildings there for um, storage of gunpowder. In 1962, by the Maritime Services Board, and it's still in use. Well, in looking at the crane, we really need to have a look at the, the graving dock that the crane was meant to service. So, in the 1930s, with the deteriorating situation in Europe, Australia had already anticipated the need for additional Pacific naval facilities to adequately service the warships of the English, American and Australian navies. The Australian Parliament in 1938 approved in principle the construction of a naval graving dock and new repair workshops to satisfy this requirement. Leopold Saville of the British engineering firm Alexander Gibbon Partners was appointed to assess 16 possible sites around Australia for this new facility and finally Garden Island was recommended as the most suitable. In May 1940 the then Prime Minister Robert Menzies announced a dry dock of a larger size than any in Australia has been an important strategic consideration since the size of capital ships has increased so greatly. The possession of such a dock would make Australia a fit base for a powerful fleet and would, in certain contingencies, enable naval operations to be conducted in Australian waters without the necessity for ships to travel 4,000 miles to Singapore for the purposes of refit and repair. A dock construction section within the Department for the Interior was established in July 1940 to oversee the construction of the graving dock, new workshops with modern machinery and a 250-tonne crane on a new <coughs> fitting out wharf. The coffer dam and closing the worksite, incorporating 170,000 feet of sheet piling and 800,000 cubic yards of stone, was commenced in December 1940 and the dock completed in 1945. So this photo shows the end of the original Garden Island with the, the prison, the new graving dock, which you'll note is 1944, so it was actually in operation before the rest of the facility was, was open. New um, workshop complex, the coffer dam has been removed, so the coffer dam actually went round there while the dock was being constructed, and then they dewatered all that and then formed a dock of concrete and uh, reclaimed all of this land here. So this is the, the, the old foreshore box point. And the location of the Garden Island Crane was in that area there, just, just off, the, off the picture. When you read about the, the Sydney Hammerhead Crane, Invariably, the Hammerhead Crane of Singapore comes up. So this is a blueprint of the Singapore Crane. So the fall of Singapore in February 1942 resulted in the loss of a major Allied naval base in the Pacific, including the giant Hammerhead Crane, completed a few years before in 1938. The loss of the Singapore base resulted in additional labour being employed on the Garden Island site and the working hours extended around the clock. The print of the Sydney Hammerhead Crane. Work was almost complete on the new graving dock when tenders were called in 1944 for a similar dockside crane to the one lost in Singapore. The construction documents were prepared by Sir William Arrell and Sir Alexander Gibbon Partners of London and Glasgow. Its main function at that stage, being on a war footing, was the removal and refitting of gun turrets to warships. And when you compare the two elevations, you can see how similar they are. I haven't been able to get too much information on the Singapore one, so I don't know what the length of the boom was. Um, but you can see all the bracing is very similar to the Sydney one. There are some differences in the horizontal bracing on the top of the boom, there and there. And you can see that the lower cord of the rear boom is different. So the Sydney one is raked at the same angle 
as the front cantilever, whereas the Singapore one is almost flat. But apart from that, they're very similar. Rick, does the Singapore one still exist? No, it's very difficult to get any information at all on the Singapore crane. I haven't been able to get a photograph of it. I've had a look at the opening ceremony of the graving dock, which was opened in 38 at the same time, and there's no sign of a crane, but that could be just the way the photographs were taken. So I don't know, but I have read reports that it was actually demolished when the, the, the Japanese were coming down the peninsula. So no, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be there. So the Sydney Steel Company, Porch Limited of Marrickville, was a successful tenderer for the structural steel superstructure of the crane. This company was founded in 1910 by Alexander Stewart with over 7,500 employees in 1936 and 11 acres of buildings by 1961. The company ceased operations in the 1960s. And in addition to the hammerhead crane, Sydney Steel also constructed on Garden Island the two floating steel caissons that were for the graving dock, so one was about two thirds of the way down the dock, the other one was right at the end to get maximum length for the ships. They also possibly did the, or fabricated the 40 tonne travelling crane on the fitting out wharf and the steel formwork for the top of the concrete piers, which I'll cover in a minute. That's the, the yard, that's um, a um, fabricated uh, girder uh, for Lifgo. So they were quite capable to do the sort of fabrication that was required on the, on the hammerhead crane. Okay, so the fitting out wharf on Garden Island. So you can note in this photograph a couple of things. First of all, the wharf is fully pier, so you can see water on that side. You can see the edge of the coffer dam there, and you can see water in that area. So. This area here is all peered to bedrock and they're constructing the, the dock on those piers. That's the start of the construction of the 40 tonne travelling crane. So that was on rails through here. And the, the hammerhead crane is out of the picture um, in the foreground. Okay, so I want to just run through the construction of the, the hammerhead crane. So the depth of water where they were putting it was from, say, high tide down to bedrock. That was 90 feet. But first of all, the work commenced on the pier cylinders. So these are the, some of the cylinders in August 1944. Below the water, these hollow cylinders were 16 feet in diameter and each segment about, about 20 feet high, roughly. You note the timber formwork. So these were hollow and... There were four piers for the four legs of the crane. Like you said, um, the Titan is used then to transport. So these would have been poured off-site um, and then transported, uh, and they would have been close to the water's edge because they, they weighed nearly 150 tonnes each segment. And so the, the Titan would have needed to load those onto, onto the deck and then transport them across to Garden Island. So this is unloading onto Garden Island. So you can see these segments, 16 foot diameter, with a tapered top, and they would have had a tapered socket in their base so that they nested easily when they were lowered into the water. So they excavated down to bedrock, and this was outside the coffer dam, so they had to have been working with, with divers to place all these. And then the next one was just socketed into the top of the, the one below it. And so there, there would have been probably about six of these to reach water level. Okay, so these are one of the segments. You can see that they're hollow so, so the workmen can get down inside of those. And uh, these are the starter bars for connecting onto the, the, the one above it. Okay, by August, September 1946, the watering of the port four piers was underway, ready to receive the concrete filling. These segments are dropped down into staging supports that you can see around here. That's the, that's the fitting out wharf beyond that. Just enough space to drop these down and locate them in the one below. 
the pontoon of the Titan there where they would have transferred the segment from. Okay, so we're up above water level now, so there would have been six of these segments below for each pier. Uh, you can see the starter bars there ready to go into the ring, the concrete in situ ring beam around the top. Okay, so while those were being located, this is the one segment of the ring beam used to tie the four piers together. Okay, so you can see this particular assembly is for piers <coughs> B and C, so labelled A, B, C and D. Because this is now above water, the others were formwork in themselves, so concrete, so there was no stripping of formwork there, but once they got above the water, and because this was in situ concrete in there, they used formwork that they could strip above water, so these flanges here are just bolted together. So these would have been loaded onto the Titan and taken to Garden Island and then these piers here would have been placed over the existing port piers on site. And as you can see the ring beam around here, these bits are missing, they would have been put in later and bolted up, those two bits there. But these pieces here would have been easily managed by a 150 ton crane. Okay, so we're on site again, fitting out uh, wharf. Uh, so you can see this is the in situ concrete beams above the piers. So you can see a, see one of the piers there, it's a circle of it. There's one over the back there and I think there's one outside this. So you can see all the reinforcing cages placed on here ready to receive the top of the fitting out wharf. I haven't been able to find any documented um, or any text relating to this at all, but just what I've gleaned from the photographs. Um, fortunately, there were a lot of photographs taken of this stage of the work, and they were very, very good quality. They're all glass and eggs. Okay, so now we see the, the cranes, so the, the tower is complete, and they're now using balanced cantilever construction for the berm. That's not the 40 tonne crane, I think that's the crane, it, it looks like it's in line with this but it's not, I think that's the, the crane that's associated with the graving dock. The, the travelling 40 tonne crane used to assemble this is out of the picture. This is the crane here in completion, about 1950, you can see it's unpainted, you can see uh, Sydney Steel Company written on the main top girder tower. And this is one of the few photos I've found that actually has the six ton gantry service hoist out of its usual position inside the, the machinery house on top. It's a crane in service. So now go to the fabrication, construction and testing. Okay, the information for this section came from a number of sources. Um, a 1950s paper prepared by Colin Stewart, the general manager of Sydney Steel Company, and the engineer in charge of construction. Um, notes from an inspection in 1993 by Peter Stewart, relative Colin and who with his son Tim is with us tonight. Oh, hey. <laughs> Okay, so before I start this section, I need to explain the various parts of the crane because I'm referring to these not only in this section, um, but also in the following section. Um, so basically there are three main parts. Um, the 120 feet deep uh, concrete piers, which we've just touched on. Um, and incidentally, when you look, at, you look at the height of those in relation to, say, the... Um, the tower, they would be about the equivalent of that height underwater. Then we've got the 150 feet high tower and the 273 long berm. So they're the three main components. Um, the 150 um, feet square tower, 150 feet on both sides, has three equal panels, um, 50 <coughs> feet high, so three equal panels there, topped by four 20-tonne main girders. So these are the main girders which take 
um, the loads from the, uh, the, the burn. Um, a bracing stabilizers, um, each panel. So these are the A bracers. And the top bracing, A, a bracing, also supports the center of the uh, main girders. A three person lift provides access to a walkway, which then goes up into the body of the crane. Um, and stairs and walkways are on the outside of the crane as well. Now, the boom consists of two asymmetrical steel trusses made up of a long front cantilever, so that's the long front cantilever, and they're the two boom trusses, and a short rear cantilever. Short rear cantilever. Um, the top, uh, the, sorry, the level top cord, so the level top cord goes through here, and the bottom raked cords, so these are the bottom raked cords here, across the top of the tower, and then up to the short rear cantilever, are connected with tension and compression uh, members fabricated web girders fixed at node points. So these, these are the compression members, tension members, compression, tension, compression, tension. Um, and they're fixed to the top and bottom cords um, at, at the nodes. A 16 wheel crab or traveller runs on four rails, so four rails, two on each of the top of each of the trusses, um, on the front cantilever and the main machinery uh, enclosure and ballast boxes, so these are the ballast boxes at the, at the end here, um, at the, short, at the um, end of the short cantilever. And the control room to drive the whole thing is located between the two front trusses, so it's located there, and if you notice, there's a space, there's a space down between the two um, trusses where all the lifting gear runs, and the the um, control cabin has got a clear view down through that, so you can see um, what he's working on. <coughs> There are also two small machine rooms down on the lower cord uh, deck. Um, above the hat, tower to house two slewing motors. So there's a slewing motor at the front and a slewing motor, the main slewing motor is at the back, and 10 ton cable drums. So those are all housed in these small, small machine rooms. Now, the interface between the tower and the boom, so this is the critical section through here, where you've got all of the live and the dead loads created on the boom. Um, they've got to be transferred, so there basically you've got um, point loads here, so four point loads there, and they've got to be transferred down to a circular, um, uh, a, a circular um, ring down here. So the interface between the tower and the boom consists of a bottom track there, um, supported on the main tower girders. So there's the main tower girders. So all of that load goes down to there, and a spider or live ring, which is in between. Uh, and that has 96 steel rollers, uh, 14 inches in diameter. So 96 rollers here between the top and the bottom roller plates. Uh, and the top track is fixed to the underside of these drum girders here. So these drum girders take all the load from this bottom cord here down to the top track plate through the rollers to the bottom track plate and then down 
through the tower. Now the lifting gear is made up of, uh, there's, a, there's a number of um, points of lifting on it. Um, first of all, the, the critical ones are the two main, two main hooks, each at 125 tonnes each, um, and they can be coupled together. So um, with, a, um, with a, a connecting beam, so that you get the 250 tonne lift. Um, the, and there's a 40 tonne auxiliary um, hook at the front when these hooks um, are more than adequate to take the load, so they just use the 40 tonne. Um, there's a 10 tonne gantry hook which runs on the inside of the left hand side truss, you can just see it running through there. Um, and that's just for handle, handling lifting gear. For instance, the, um, the, the, uh, the beam for these two and for any other slings or whatever. That's 10 tonnes. Then there's a six tonne gantry up here which is used just for servicing. So it has its own set of tracks which go into the top of the uh, machinery room. They can be taken out so it can work on that. The crab can be taken right through and could, so it can lift items off that when they need to be serviced. Um, and it can also drop whatever or lift down right down to the ground. So um, there's no need to use any of these hooks for that. So that's six tonne service um, gantry. Then there's a light um, workshop hook. It's just outside the, um, the machine room and it drops down through a hole down through the bottom trusses and it goes right down to the ground. That's just for lifting up nuts and bolts and whatever they need for in here. I don't know what the capacity of that was. <coughs> um, and the smallest um, hoist is for the raising of the, um, of the lift, lift room door so that the six tonne hoist can be um, taken back and stored inside the machinery room and that's just dropped down. Okay, so while the piers and the fitting out wharf, wharf were being constructed, work was progressing on the steel superstructures in the workshops of Sydney Steel in Marrickville. Specifications call for the pre-assembly off-site of both the tower sides and the complete boom to check the fairing of the connecting rivets and bolt holes. Okay, so we're talking about these individual sides of the tower and the whole of the boom, excluding all of this um, stuff. So basically from the top cord down to the bottom cord, all that had to be um, trial erected at Marrickville. Um, so the tower sides were easily laid out. I mean, they're just flat. So they were um, they were just laid out on the ground in the in the um, what they called the outer yard, with supporting concrete blocks below the gusset plates, just to check that all of these holes were accurate, so they didn't get to site and then find out they had to re-drill them or remake the member. The boom, however, was more difficult as the bottom cord was raked. Okay, so we've got a raking cord here and a raking cord on the rear. Um, and that would have required long props because it needed to be supported underneath these node points here. So those, those props would have had to have been quite long. The solution was to erect the boom upside down as there was only an eight inch camber in the top cord. Okay, so it's a camber, slight camber up um, in the top cord. And there is actually a camber in this in this boom as well. So all this was inverted and um, trial uh, laid out in the outer yard. Again, concrete blocks 
um, or placed under each node point. So each of these node points here. Um, and at each splice, so each of these, um, the splice was 60% pinned and bolted. So they didn't put all the bolts in. They, they just had to make sure that everything fitted, basically. Um, following the trial erection, all fabricated members were disassembled and transported to the site. When the interface between the tower and the berms, we're talking about this interface here, between the tower and the berm, uh, was reached, the segments of the bottom track plates were firstly levelled with a theodolite, so it was fairly easy to level these. These had to be very level, both of them. Um, so the bottom, the bottom track plates could be easily leveled, set the theodolite up on top of the tower, um, and then just adjust the, um, adjust the plates with a theodolite uh, using pairs of tapered wedges. So they just drive the tapered wedges in until they got an exact level surface on the top of the track plates. Uh, then these were bolted to the tower girders. Underneath here, there's a number of girders that run across that pick up these, um, these track plates, um, leaving a one and a half inch gap between the bottom of the track plate and the top of the girders. And this was then grouted up with a two to one mix um, cement, uh, cement mix. The top track plates also had to be accurately fitted to the bottom of the drum girders. Okay, so these there, the drum girders there, and these top track plates had to be accurately fitted to those. These girders, though, were, were 50 feet in diameter um, and weighed 30 tonnes. No machine was available in Australia to carry out this work. To machine their 30 inch wide bottom surfaces, so the, the bottom surfaces of these, um, these drum girders, 30 inches wide, 2 foot 6, um, within the same accuracy that was required for the bottom track plates, um, the girders, so this whole assembly here, was erected upside down, or assembled upside down, um, at, I assume at Marrickville. Um, complete with their spreaders, so they've got spreaders there to keep them accurately aligned. Uh, the pivot beam which runs through the base and which the whole of this assembly turns on. Um, uh, and the bottom uh, and bottom truss cords attached. So these bottom truss cords were also attached to the um, drum girders. Now, a tool, because there was nothing available in Australia, a tool was manufactured um, consisting of two 24 by 7 inch RSJs plated together to make a rigid beam 30 feet long. One end was allowed to rotate on the pivot beam, so you've got a pivot beam in the centre there, and this is all upside down, remember, um, so that they could machine from the top. Um, and this was powered by a 30 horsepower motor, and the other end, the cutting end, um, was supported on a temporary cir um, circular track, which was accurately um, levelled beforehand. During construction, the machine uh, and, and the machining of that bottom surface, a two-ton weight had to be placed on the cutting head to stop the tool chatter. Uh, on completion, the spider, top track plate, drum girders were placed in position and secured with a hollow centre pin, so a centre pin on which this rotates, um, through which the power uh, cable passed. So the power came up the tower into the centre pin, the hollow centre pin came up, it had some brushes on there, and, and the power was then distributed up through the tower. Okay, we've mentioned the boom was assembled using the balanced cantilever approach. Having a 40 tonne erection crane 
made it possible to assemble on the ground sections of the boom up to 40 tonnes in weight and 60 feet in length. So they didn't have to individually bring up these, say, web members and the top and the bottom cords. They can actually assemble large sections of this on the ground, which is a lot easier, um, and then lift that into position and bolt it at the node points. So when the, so the balance cantilever construction, you start in the middle, basically, and you work out so that the, um, the assembly that you put on this side equals the weight of the assembly on the other side. Um, so when the rear cantilever reached its final length, so they couldn't put any more on that, um, the ballast boxes were installed, so these are the ballast boxes at the back, ballast boxes underneath the machine room, and the machinery located inside the machine room. So as the front cantilever progressed out here, um, 175 tonnes of cast iron billets were progressively installed in the ballast boxes, the ballast boxes, to counterweight the additional load on the front cantilever. Now there were 100 individual tests during the commissioning of the crane in 1950, and several are worthy of mention. <coughs> The maximum test lift at 118 feet radius, so the radius from the centre here to say 118 feet, which is probably about that, was 312 tonnes. So it was rated, rated at 250 tonnes, but the test lift was 312 tonnes. Um, and that caused a deflection in the, in the tip of the boom um, of only five inches, which when the load was released, it came back up to its normal position. Now the efficiency of the braking system was also tested. So with a 250 tonne load in mid-air, so the, these two main hooks were coupled, and a 250 um, steel weight was placed on those and brought up to a position here. So with the test load in mid-air, both the working and the safety brakes were manually held open. So the load was allowed to free fall. Okay, so from there, um, the brakes were then reapplied and their efficiency recorded. Okay, no, no questions on that? Go to some other years. You say that the individual sections of the boom could be lifted up up to 40 tonnes yes, and they yeah. were then bolted on. Did, bolted did that on. remain as a bolted connection rather than I, I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to get up there to, to find out. Uh, I just wondered, oh, yeah, do you know? Yeah, they They were all riveted. riveted. Right, okay. So there's no bolts. So they would have only been put, it, uh, put bolts in, say, for a temporary connection until, until the rivets were put in. Oh, good. Right. Just another bit of information. The yeah. weight was actually 295 tonnes, not 175. Sorry, the which? The counter weight, or the what you call the ballast. Oh, yes. The cast iron box is 295 tonnes. I'll talk to you later about that. 295, not 275. Yes, I think you said 175. Oh, no, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, 275, so 290, yeah. right, okay. So now we look at some details of the crane itself. So photographs from this section came from a number of sources. Peter Stewart from his 1993 inspection, Tom Hughes with his 2000 inspection, and Tim Stewart on the demolition and I took some photos during 2012 to 2014. So most of these are um, photographs of what we've been talking about on the model. Okay, so we talked about the slewing interface. So that 
section there is the top of the crane, the tower of the crane. The, the main girders are directly underneath this, this area here. These are the drum girders that I was talking about. They're directly located over the spider. This one, incidentally, is the rear uh, slew drive. There were actually two slew drives. This is the rear one. This is the detail, detail of that slew drive. So what have we got? Okay, so that's the spider in there with the 14-inch diameter rollers. That's the, the top roller plate through there. And it's fixed to the bottom flange of the drum girder. So that's the, the base of the drum girder. Uh, and that's the bottom flange. So that bottom flange was two foot six wide, uh, and of course the the rollers would have been a corresponding length as well. So that just sits there and revolves at half the speed of the boom. Uh, we then got the ring gear here, pinion, and this particular drive was the front one, slewing drive. Again, yeah, that's the top of the tower. Now the reason for the two drives, okay? So we've got two pinions. The main and the auxiliary, each with an inline dog clutch, so, you could, so they could take out any or both of the drives if they wanted to. Okay, so this is the slewing drive mechanism. Got the electric motor here. We've got the working and emergency brakes here. Then it goes through a gearbox. That's the shaft over the bevel gears. And then the shaft that goes down to the pinion on the ring gear is underneath that dog clutch. So, yeah, so the reason for having the two slew drives is that if one happened to break down, the other could be used to slew the load over the wharf. And if one had to be repaired, they could still use the, still use the crane. View inside the, the other um, secondary machine room. This is for the 10 ton hoist for lifting gear. Okay, so the control room, you can see it sits between, between the two trusses. It's the machine room there. It has both forward facing windows and downward facing windows as well. So between that slot between the two trusses, you've got a good view down of what you're lifting. So there you can see the front windows and the downward facing windows. So they have a very, very clear view down there. Okay, so from the control room, you can see the, um, the, that slot between trusses and the lifting gear. So you can see that the two main hooks the 125 tonne hooks are connected by this, and that gives you your 250 tonne lift. That is the 40 tonne auxiliary hook, and all of these three supported on the on the crab. Just a detail of the, and that's the right hand side, not the left hand side. Boom truss, but you can see the, the structure. Okay, so this clearly identifies the truss design. We fabricated web girders for the Compression members, so the compression members, that's a compression member there, so it's a truss girder. The tension member is just flats, flat bar, with spaces in between. They only have to take tension, so there's no bucket. So this is the right hand deck, the two rails to take the, um, the crab. So that's the crab sitting there. It has four bogies, four four wheel bogies, so 16 wheels all together. Just flange wheels and they run on the on the track on top of the truss. So that's the top core of the truss there. They're the web members underneath. So the lifting gear goes down in between two that, that slot between the two trusses. So there's the lifting gear, two main hooks, the auxiliary hook, and you can just see there the control room. So this is taken from the front cable mounting frame. So you can just see the front cable mounting frame here. In front of the machine room main machine room, top of what we see. Okay, so we see the, the gantry rails at the top here. They disappear in through the front wall. So that's a horizontal opening door there. So it's hinged, hinged at its top surface. It has a hoist, its own hoist, to open it vertically, <coughs> and the gantry can then move inside. The space is just left open underneath that with the cables for running onto the cable drums. Uh, this is looking out towards the front of the crane, and we see three of the four cable drums. So starting from the top, these are a pair of drums which control the lateral movement of the crab along the top 
that the front cantilever. The second drum is actually a pair of drums, so you've got double cables that come out to the auxiliary hook on the front of the crab, and the <coughs> rear cable drum is the for the number one hook, a number two hook is behind the photographer. The, the one and two drums were identical. Uh, and just on that previous slide, so all the mechanical and electrical equipment uh, was designed and manufactured in England. So that was brought in. Everything else basically was manufactured uh, in Australia. So the crane was completed in 1951, taking seven years to build, and is the largest and only crane of its type in the Southern Hemisphere. In 2007, it was placed on the New South Wales National Trust Heritage at Risk Register. In June 2007, the Sydney Opera House was placed on the UNESCO World Heritage List and the crane lies within the, uh, the two and a half kilometre buffer zone around the Opera House. So it's actually in an exclusion zone. In August 2013, the Navy announced that the crane would be demolished to allow additional berthing space for its new Navy fleet. Demolition commenced this year. Okay, thank you. How was it decided that the dockyard could do without a big crane? It was to do with the new, the new fleet that's coming online. Apparently, they made an argument that these, this fleet has helicopters on board that would be used extensively and they wanted to fly those in. The other reason was that in 2007, because the crane hadn't been maintained for decades, a big piece of iron fell off, a rusted piece of iron fell off. So that's why you see all that scaffolding underneath it. It wasn't that was nothing to do with the with the restoration of the crane, although a lot of people thought it at the time. That was just to prevent people getting hit by by debris. So those are basically the two reasons, and, I, and there's probably other reasons too. People maybe on the, the finger wolf and Willamaloo Bay just didn't want the, the crane to obliterate the view of the harbour. Did it ever get much hit? Uh, now, the last time it was used, I think it was in 98, I think, for taking... Oh, when the Flying Scot Scotsman was out, it, it was used to, to unload that. And then apart from that, I think 98, I think, was the last, the last use. Mm -hmm. And that was to take big electrical um, equipment out or unload. And what have we got to replace it? Mobiles. Big mobiles. Tower yeah. cranes. Three of them. Yeah. Well, you saw the, you saw the tower cranes. Yeah. That are demolishing it, yeah. So that's where have the uh, dismantled pieces gone? Ah, have they been preserved? Good question. Good question. When it was announced that the um, the crane was going to be demolished, there were statements being made by the Navy and government to say that critical items were going to be retained and displayed. Now, I would have imagined that some of those items would have been the crab for a start, so it could just be lifted off the rails and displayed perhaps in the, um, the museum that's on Garden Island now, where they've got the display of all the steam hammers and, and bits of equipment on display now. So that, that would have been an ideal thing. I think some of the hooks should have been displayed. Certainly the 125 tonne hooks should have been displayed. Apart from that, there are probably other things. But um, there is a committee formed by the Navy Heritage Group and I've been invited to join that group in September of this year when it kicks off to record the heritage of the crane. It's probably too late to do anything about retrieving or restoring any of the stuff that's been sold on for scrap. That would have been cut up by now. So I don't know, I don't actually know what has been, been retained. But hopefully at least those items should have been. Some of the hooks and at least the crab. Yeah, all the things you mentioned, plus a lot more, are being retained. Oh, good. Contract re requires they be stored, basically, until the Navy or the Defence Department decide how and where they're going. Where they're going, yeah. Yep. But also, prior to the crane being demolished, they had a heritage consultant do mm -hmm. quite significant surveys. Yep. That consultant was involved in the demolition in terms of protecting items. So, so I, I don't know where, when or where they will be just because I don't think the pension department knows yet. Yeah. Okay, well that's 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 good. At least some of the items are being retained. So the, the crab, for instance, is being being retained? Fantastic. Okay, good. 
So yeah. you mentioned lifting locomotives and stuff like that. Yeah. Wasn't that the purpose of partly of like the larger system was to use like in, in conjunction with like Glasgow, you transfer your locomotives like where you want around the world. Like it was a lot to do with transferring locomotives, wasn't it? Part of like as well as tariffs. This this crane? Yeah. Oh, I, I, don't, I haven't read that. Engines. It could have been. Like I'm not Scotland. Yeah. Um, distributing around the world. It was done by the Titan. Oh, sorry, yeah, you're right. You're right, it was done by the Titan. Yes, sorry. That's yeah. photograph this. Yes, no, yeah, I have seen it, that photograph, yeah. Anything we've got about the lifting speed? Oh, look, all that was done in the test. Yes, look, there was slewing speeds. So would take, so, they, so the, those were the things that were in the test. There were over 100 tests that were carried out during the commissioning of it. So the, the slewing speed, so it was 10 minutes for a full revolution. There were lifting speeds fully loaded. I, 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 don't know the, I don't know the speeds, no. Apart from the testing loads, was there any work that was kept of the maximum loads that were lifted when it was really angry in the operation? No, I don't know. Were no I don't know. ever shifted? I don't know where that information would be. Hopefully, this committee that I'm going on may have some of those records, but I don't know. The idea is to get get persons together who were involved with the crane while it was while it was being used. So hopefully some of those that information will come out then. Navy records have hit for bit national archives. It may, they may. Mm. Yeah. Is it true that the there were three such planes, one in Glasgow? Yes, so there I think there were about six in Glasgow. I don't know how many are left, but some of those have been converted into observation decks, restaurants, and there was talk at some time, I don't know whether you saw that artist's impression in the newspaper, they were thinking of using this, this as a restaurant, but you've got the problem that being on Navy land and having very, very restricted access, I mean, public have got access to the original Garden Island, but it's only a very small portion, and you can only get in there by ferry <coughs> anyway, so to have public on their main fitting out wharf, but I mean, there's no way that they would have allowed that. There are at least two cranes in Glasgow, and one features in the Commonwealth Games. Yes, that's right, yeah. in the back of the Commonwealth Games, yes, yeah, all that one. Was there only the one crane driver for such a large and complex structure? Yeah. Certainly the driver, and that he would have been installed in the cab, because he, all he had was just basically switches, that was all. But there would have been other maintenance, particularly in the main machine room, for instance, there would have been other maintenance persons. But the slewing motors, for instance, would have been controlled from the cab. All of the lifting gear would have been controlled from there. Well, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.